moment. Only in that relationship with our Heavenly Father do we find everything that satisfies us, and so He is our great priority. Welcome to Corinth Baptist Church Sunday Worship Services with Pastor Teacher Joey Carroll. When pastors fall into sin, they gouge out the road of the gospel. If you're born again, and yet you are unrepentant in sin and unwilling to deal with sin in your life, you're gouging out the road to advance the gospel. We're in Ephesians chapter 6, and I want to read to you verses 18 through 20, and then we will pray together and jump in the text. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 18 and 20. The Apostle Paul says, With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit, and with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints, and pray on my behalf that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains or a prisoner that in proclaiming it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just praise you and thank you so much once again for the opportunity that we have this morning to gather as a family of faith, those who have been purchased with precious blood, and just to celebrate what grace and what mercy that we have been given and shown. Father, we praise you for the cross of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. God, we're so amazed. We stand in awe of the fact that God became a man in every way and lived a perfect life as God, and then died on the cross as a perfect, spotless, sinless substitute in our place. Lord, we rejoice in that, and we celebrate that. We put our faith in that, and that faith alone, we know, will carry us to glory one day in the presence of God, where we will worship you forever. Father, thank you for every single family here this morning, every single individual And Lord, I pray that as I preach and teach the Word of God, Your Spirit would open our ears so that we can hear, our minds so that we might understand and humble our hearts, Father, in order that we might believe and walk obediently by faith in what we learn. Lord, we love You and thank You in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Now, when you come to this issue here that we have before this morning with prayer, you understand a couple of things um, that we've just come out of the context of the armor of God. And you immediately go into this away from the armor, this thought of praying. And the mistake that you don't want to make, that a lot of people make, is they have this idea of praying on the armor. And, And don't forget, though, the armor is a metaphor, so there's no need to pray on the breastplate, so to speak, and the belt and pray on the metaphor of the spirit, of the sword. But what you do want to do as you pray, because all this is woven together, is to remember those principles that played a role in the metaphor. In other words, righteousness. You need to pray that as you face spiritual battle, that you will walk in the righteousness that has been placed in your heart through the gospel in Jesus Christ. Truth. You need to pray that you will walk in truth, that you will understand truth in the midst of your circumstances. And that you will cling to that truth as you walk through this. And when we talked about uh, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, I want to key on that word preparation now because you need to thank God that because of the gospel, you are prepared for spiritual battle. You see, without the gospel, you are horribly, unthinkably unprepared for spiritual battle. In fact, you've already lost because you belong to Satan. But because you put your faith and trust in Christ, you've been prepared for battle. God has 
adequately and sufficiently over, uh, over more so prepared you to do battle spiritually. And so, and then again, the, the, the faith, you pray that your faith might hold fast. The helmet of salvation, you pray that you'd wait upon the deliverance of God. So there is a lot of interweaving here between the idea now that we pray because we understand the provisions that God has made for us in the armor. So this morning we need to jump into the task of understanding all this business about prayer. But normally when we think about prayer, if I were to ask you about your prayer life, probably most of you would confess that it's the time that you bow before God and you give Him a list of things that you would like for Him to do today. And then you would ask, of course, if it's your will. But that's okay, but you need to understand prayer is so much more important than that. Prayer is a primary means of worship where we express praise to God, our love for God, for our delight in God. So prayer is so much more worship than it is anything else. It's more about us aligning our hearts with the will and the Word of God than it is trying to get God to do something. We're really there to let God work on us, not us tell God what we need Him to do. So prayer is absolutely fascinating. It's the way that we confess our sins to God and not just confess our sins, but ask for the grace of repentance that we might actually turn from those sins. I don't know if you've made a fool out of yourself before God or not like I have, but I can't count how many times I've gone back to God asking Him to forgive me for something I've done over and over and over and received forgiveness and then I'm back the next morning. God, I did it again. You see, not only do we bow to confess, but we bow to receive the strength and the power and the grace to walk in repentance, okay? But when we come to this passage this morning, we understand the necessity of prayer in spiritual warfare because it's in prayer that we are actually able to stand against the enemy in all of his attacks. We stand on our knees as we pray. And prayer is the primary means in which you intercede for your brothers and sisters in Christ when they're going through spiritual battle. You stand in the gap on your knees by praying on their behalf. So prayer is so much more. But this morning he wants us to bring us and teach us how prayer works in the midst of spiritual battle. Now, if you'll notice, I, I, I drew this passage up. Uh, I'll, I'll take it out right there. Just ignore that below that. I drew this first passage up this morning up for the firefighters and I asked them to look at that passage and tell me what re word is repeated most often. I was trying to teach them how to do a little bit of Bible study on their own. And it didn't take them too long to figure out the key word in the passage that's repeated four times. I'll pause just for a second so you can figure that out. But Paul's emphatically trying to teach us how to pray in the midst of spiritual warfare. And he leads us through this thought by repeating this word four times. The word all. And around this word or this word all, he's actually dividing this thought up or this one passage into four different phrases. We do spiritual battle with all prayer and petition. There's one. We pray at all times in the Spirit. There's two. We be on the alert with all perseverance. That's three. And we petition or perseverance and petition for all the saints. That's four. In effect, he laid out four ways that we stand against Satan when we get on our knees and we pray to God. And you know what, this morning what I want to do is spend our time is just talking simply about these four phrases, okay? So the first phrase is, with all prayer and petition. This is what we are to do in the midst of spiritual battle. Now, just thinking about prayer in general, by the way, this is the, the general word for prayer. And the word petition here is a much more specific word for prayer. This idea of petition. But just prayer in general. 
a defining mark for you as a Christian ought to be the fact that you pray a very long periods and very significant period of your life needs to be spent in prayer. You see that in the Lord? And when you think about the Son of God spending so much time in prayer praying to the Father, it, it certainly should go without saying that that needs to be the model and picture of who we are as the children of God. Tons of passages I could go to. Mark 1.35, very early in the morning while it was still dark, Jesus went off by Himself to a quiet place so that he could pray. A couple of passages at Luke that we'll look into when we get to Luke here in a couple of weeks. Luke 6, before he chose the twelve, Jesus spent the entire night in prayer. And then you get to Luke 9, which is actually the turning point of the Gospel of Luke. It's where Peter confesses who Jesus Christ is. Remember, he asked the question, or Jesus asked the question, who do the people say that I am? And Peter says, oh, you're... You're the Son of God. You're the Christ. And Jesus goes, oh, you didn't get that from yourself, Peter. That was revealed to you by the Father. Remember that? The passage immediately before that, it says, while Jesus was praying by Himself, He asked, who do you say that I am? In other words, the whole context of their revelation came because the Lord was praying on their behalf. So prayer needs to define us as the people of God. But in spiritual warfare, he mentions not all in all your prayers, but he also mentions this idea of petition. Some people say, oh, it's just synonyms. But if you look at that word petition, you learn that it's a little more specific. You're understanding what is going on in the midst of spiritual warfare and you're praying specifically, not just generally. i give you an idea of this. Um, when Paige lost her dad, I got a lesson in prayer. It's been 10 years ago this December. I didn't know what to do. He died sort of unexpectedly. And so I went into me mode, trying to give advice, trying to give instructions, trying to tell her how to think and how to feel and those sort of things. That bombed. Tried to tell her I love her, tried to hold her, tried to hug her. 99% of the time, that bombed. You know what I should have been doing all along? On my knees, praying specifically as she went through all the disappointment, all the depression, all the frustration, even the anger at times. The way that I was supposed to be interceding for her is on my knees, praying about those specific things in her heart and life. And since Carrie and Brad are not here this morning, I'll mention that. I knew immediately when Carrie's mom passed away that it was going to be massive spiritual warfare that was going to come against Carrie in every way, shape, and form. They're still young in the faith. I pulled Brad aside and I said, let me tell you how to lead in this situation. On your knees. And that's exactly what Brad's been doing. I knew how to pray for Carrie a little more specifically. I encouraged y'all to pray, but I got my wife to pray, who's the strongest prayer that I know. Not only does she know how to pray specifically, but she's been through the exact same thing and began to pray for Carrie in very specific ways and ask her specific questions. And it's still a battle for Carrie, and it will be for months and months to come. But we intercede on her behalf and we, in all of our prayers, we petition God about particular things that those two young believers would not get discouraged in the way. That they wouldn't suffer from depression and broken hearts and not understanding why and all these sort of things. So the first thing that we need to understand in battle, in spiritual battle, is that we pray and make specific petitions. Okay? I'll show you a passage later in Philippians 1 where all of this takes place. So with all of our prayer and petitions, we are to stand at ready in spiritual warfare against Satan for ourselves and for our brothers and sisters in Christ. Second thought is, number two, we pray at all times in the Spirit. Again, this is telling us when we should pray at all times. There's so many times Paul tries to teach us this. In 1 Thessalonians 5, he says, pray without ceasing. In Colossians 4, he says, devote yourselves to prayer 
keeping alert in it. Philippians 4, 6, he says, In everything, by prayer and supplications, let your requests be made known to God. In fact, I won't take time this morning. I got it in my notes, but I know it'll take quite a bit of time. In Luke 18, and we'll, we'll be there so I can, I can sidestep it right now. In Luke 18, Jesus sits the disciples down and tells them a parable in order that they might learn that they should pray at all times and not lose heart. Jesus taught them this and told them, guys, you got to pray about everything all the time. Our Lord taught us that. Someone said, I think this past week, I don't remember if it was Mark Dever or not, that the church should be so busy praying that if an unbeliever ever came into their midst, they would find the whole experience awkward and weird and never come back. Now, I'm thankful for this church. This is the most praying church that I've been, ever been a part of. And on Wednesday night, it gets serious around here, and I'm so thankful. I'm just amazed at the spiritually mature prayers that I hear. But really, so much of our time should be in worship. Not just singing, but also in worship praying. And the reason that we get awkward when someone prays for more than 30 seconds is because we're immature and not used to it. It's just like exegetical or expositional preaching and teaching. If you're not used to it, never been exposed to it, don't see the need in it, it's awkward. And then you spend some time in it and you're like, oh, that's all I really want to hear. And brothers and sisters, if we really matured in our prayer, you'd get frustrated if we spent five minutes in prayer. You're like, what are we doing? Are we just telling God, we got this, thank you, I'm good with today? You can go take care of somebody else? No, our lives have to be defined. We have to learn to pray at all times. And then he adds this modifying phrase, in the Spirit. (laughs) We need to talk about that, don't we? What in the world does it mean to pray in the Spirit? I got on Amazon yesterday. You can buy a fog machine with four different lights, strobe lights, four different colors, for 40 bucks. You put that thing beside your bed, flip on those lights, and that fog will be changing all kinds of colors as you're praying in the Spirit. Is that it? That's not it. It doesn't have anything to do with it. I make fun of that, but I actually had a friend go to Arizona as a youth pastor, had a thousand youth at that church, and he said the very first thing he did was through the fog machine that they had in the trash. had a fog machine. Does praying in the Spirit mean you light a bunch of candles and burn incense? No. Praying in the Spirit means that you put on this mystical, magical sort of flair about you and use funny words? No. Does it mean praying in some unknown prayer language? No. Does it mean praying in tongues? No. That's not what this passage is talking about. In fact... He's already mentioned the Spirit of God twice in the book of Ephesians and linked linked him very carefully to specific topics. Look back up in verse 17. Part of the armor. We just heard from the Spirit in the passage immediately to this idea of praying in the Spirit. Verse 17, take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. In other words, the Spirit's weapon in spiritual battle is the Word. And we talked last week the fact that the Spirit wrote the Word. We don't even have the Word of God without the Spirit of God. So inseparably, the Word of God is linked to the Spirit of God. And this is certainly not the only place. Uh, Let me show you. I'm skipping all kinds of slides for you guys this morning. Thankfully, you don't have to put up with all this business. Let me show you one passage. Jude 16, verses 16 through 20. Watch this. And it's in the context, now listen, it's in the context of people sliding into the church that are deceivers, that are there to cause division, unbelievers. Now notice, these are grumblers finding fault, following after their own lust. They speak arrogantly, flattering people for the sake of gaining an advantage. Notice this, but you, beloved, ought to remember 
the words that were spoken beforehand by the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ, in other words, the Word of God, that they were saying to you, in the last time there will be mockers following after their own ungodly lust. These are the ones who cause divisions, the worldly minded, and they're without the Spirit. But then he comes back to this idea. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Spirit. Again, we're in the context of the Spirit. And again, the Holy Spirit is linked to people who are listening and obeying the Word of God. You can't get away from this. The Word of God is inseparably linked to the Spirit of God. But that's not the only thing. Still in the book of Ephesians, go back to Ephesians chapter 3. I want to show you one other thing in the context of prayer that the Spirit of God is linked to. Ephesians chapter 3, look at verse 14. For this reason, Paul says, I bow my knees before the Father. We're in prayer. Okay? I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name that He would grant you according to the riches of His glory to be strengthened with power through who? His Spirit in the inner man. So now He's linked the power of God and the Spirit of God together. And this takes place right before chapter 4 because in chapter 4, He's going to tell you to walk worthy of the calling that you've received. If you're going to be able to walk worthy, you're going to have to have power. It, you just can't do it by yourself. Who's going to give you that kind of power? It's the Spirit of God. He's going to empower you. So now we've got two thoughts, and there's only one more. We've got two thoughts. The Spirit of God is tied to the Word of God. The Spirit of God is tied to the power of God. Now, if you want to see both of these together, keep your, uh, keep your finger there. Turn over one or two pages to Philippians chapter 1, verse 18 and a half. Philippians 1, 18 and a half. Now let me give you the context before I read this and you'll see the power of God through the Holy Spirit. Okay? Paul's in prison. He doesn't know if he's going to be beheaded or not. Okay? He's been preaching the gospel. He was thrown into prison for preaching the gospel. His trial's coming up. Doesn't have a lawyer back then. He could get beheaded. He could not. He really doesn't know. But he senses that the Spirit of God has told him, no, you're not going to get beheaded this time, Paul. We're going to let you go because we've got to get back to the work with the gospel. So that's what he's thinking, okay? But in the midst of this, whether he lives or whether he dies, Paul's desire is to magnify and glorify Christ. Now, how is he going to do that? So look at 18 and a half where it starts. Yes, and I will rejoice. Notice, for I know that this experience will turn out for my deliverance, not get out of prison, keep reading. This will turn out for my deliverance through your prayers and the provision of the Holy Spirit or the Spirit of Jesus Christ according to my earnest expectation and hope that I will not be put to shame in anything, but that with all boldness Christ will even now as always be exalted in my body, whether I live or whether I die. Paul says, I'm in a spiritual battle. I'm facing death. And my greatest fear is that I will ruin the name of Christ in my death. i got to be delivered from this battle. And so I'm so thankful that you've been praying that I would be renewed in my spirit. And I'm so thankful for the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. I know that whether I live or die, Christ will be exalted. That's power. Don't be amazed at Paul. Be amazed that the Spirit of God does this sort of thing for folks. But it came through prayer and it came through Power from the Holy Spirit. So you've got the Spirit tied to the Word of God. You've got the Spirit tied to the power of God. And there's one more passage. Let me see if I put it in here for you. 
I don't know if I did or not. I did. Third and last thing the Spirit of God is tied to. Romans 8, 26 and 27. In the same way, the Spirit also helps our weaknesses, for we do not know how to pray. Ah, we're in the context of prayer. We don't know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And He who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of of God. Now you've got the Spirit interceding on your behalf according to the will of God. So you've got the Holy Spirit, listen, don't let me lose you. You've got the Holy Spirit tied to the Word of God, the power of God, and the will of God. Now, go pray in the Spirit. And you should be very, you should very easily be able to tell me what that means. It's going to God, being sensitive to the Spirit, that He might help you understand the Word of God for your specific situation, that you might be granted the grace of God and the power of God that you could walk in obedience and that the will of God might be accomplished in your life or in my wife's life as she battles the death of her father. See that? That's praying in the Spirit because those are the three things that the Spirit's doing in your life. He's teaching you the Word of God. He's filling you with the power of God because He wants the will of God to be accomplished in your life. It's not mystical. It's not magical. Pray at all times, He says, in the Spirit. And that's how you do spiritual battle. The Word of God, the power of God, and the will of God. Now, let me go back and see if I can find my passage. I'll just go back here. If I can. Yeah, it's not going to let me go back. You just go back to Ephesians chapter 6 now. There, there you go. Let's go back to this passage. So, praying in the Spirit at all times, with all prayer and petition, and with this in view, third thing is, be on the alert with all perseverance. And this teaches us how to pray. So if you're a facts kind of guy and you're just like, just please, just give me the facts. Here you go. There's only two verbs in this passage for spiritual warfare. Pray and be alert. Pray and be alert. Now, I will tell you this. The word alert in the Greek means losing sleep. Now, when was the last time you lost sleep because you were praying? Or have you been falling asleep while you're praying? See, spiritual warfare is very serious. God knows it. And that's why He's telling us to be watchful, to be careful, to always be on the alert and persevere in your prayers. In fact, since you've got your Bible, let me show you a couple of times. Uh, Keep your finger there in Ephesians and go back to Luke chapter 21. I'm picking on Luke because we're about to go to the Gospel of Luke. Go to Luke 21. And if you have subheadings in your Bible, look at verse 10 so you can see the context of what Jesus is actually talking about. So if you're looking in Luke 10, He's talking about things to come, the end times, okay? Now, if you'll turn over to verse 34, I'll begin reading. Jesus is teaching the disciples about end times and He has a word of instruction for them. Verse 34, He says, Be on guard so that your hearts will not be weighted down with dissipation and drunkenness and the worries of life, and that the day will not come on you suddenly like a trap, for it will come upon all those who dwell on the face of all the earth. But keep on the alert at all times praying that you may have strength to escape all these things that are about to take place and stand before the Son of God. You know what you need to do to prepare for end times? Be on the alert and pray. Pray for strength, that you'll be able to stand in the midst of that and glorify Christ. That's what you need to know about end times. Watch and pray. In fact, our Lord did this 
uh, flip back Mark 14. I picked Mark here because he gives us the most detail. Turn back to Mark 14, verses 32. You'll see our Lord succeed in this, and you'll see the apostles fail. Exceedingly stressful time, exceedingly strong time of spiritual warfare in the life of our Lord. Mark 14, 32. They came to a place named Gethsemane. He said to His disciples, sit here until I have prayed. And He took with Him Peter and James and John and began to be very distressed and troubled. And he said to them, My soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch. He went a little beyond them and he fell to the ground and began to pray that if it were possible, the hour might pass away from him. And he was saying, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup, I would add, of your wrath from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. And he came and found them sleeping. And he said, Peter... Simon, are you asleep? Could you not keep watch for one hour? Keep watching and praying that you may not come into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away and he prayed again, saying the same words. And again he came and he found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy and they did not know what to answer him. And he came the third time and he said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? It's enough. Get up. The hour has come. Behold. Look now, is what that means. The Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let's go. Now let me ask you, who was prepared for the next 30 minutes that was about to take place and who was not? Because it was in the garden that Jesus glorified the Father and stood fast, right? And it was in the garden that all the disciples ran away. What made the difference? One was alert and kept persevering in prayer. And the rest were sleeping. I think that may be why Paul's plan with this word, lose sleep in your prayer. Lose sleep. I know I've told you this story before, but every time I think of this, I think of Stephen McDougall. When I told him I had cancer, it broke him. And he said, brother, I will be praying for your surgery. He began on his knees praying before my surgery started. He prayed throughout my surgery and he told me before surgery, he said, you call me as soon as you can. I'll be praying. Well, after surgery, it took me a couple hours to wake up. Took me a couple more hours to get myself about me. And it took me a couple of more hours to remember to call Steve. And during that a long period of time of several hours, he had been on his knees praying for me, losing sleep. And I confess later, brother, I could have called you two hours earlier, but I forgot. But he wasn't bothered by that. He knew that he needed to be on the alert, watchful, praying for me and he persevered and he didn't move and he didn't get up. He stayed down until he heard my voice. That's what we need to do for one another. Why is that so difficult for us? Why are we okay of getting on our knees for five minutes? Our children are so important to us. Our spouses are so important to us. This church is so important to us. Well, if it's really that important, Be on the alert and persevere in prayer and get on your knees. That's where you need to be. That's where the battle is fought. And as all these young kids turn into teenagers, trust me, your advice will roll in one ear and out the other. Your hugs will be halfway rejected. But now you're praying? That's going to change things. And you find yourself on your knees, steadfast, being alert and praying for them. The last phrase that we have before this, us this morning is the idea of praying for all the saints. And this one should come, obviously, without ever having to mention it, right? 
For whom do we intercede? For our brothers and sisters in Christ. Why in the world do we find this such a difficult thing to do? Why in the world is it so hard to remember to pray for Carrie? I know what you'll say. We're busy. We're busy. I know you're busy. But you know what the struggle that is that she's going through? Everybody in the house has got struggles. Why, why is it so hard to remember that? I think in our busyness, we find ourselves being pretty selfish. And we ought to constantly be asking the Spirit of God to put people on our hearts and minds that we need to be praying for and spend the day in prayer for them. Luke 22, you don't have to turn there. Again, the Gospel of Luke, right? Listen to the words of our Lord to Peter. This must have been absolutely frightening. Should have been terrifying to Peter, but I don't think he understood. The Lord said on the way to the garden, He said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail, and you, when you've turned again, strengthen your brothers. Can you imagine that? Getting an email from the morning. Hey, just want to let you know, Satan's going to rake you through the coals today. (laughs) Be terrified. And then he goes, but I've prayed for you. You'll be all right. I like to get that email every day. But you do. Tomorrow or next week, Satan's going to rake one of y'all through the coals. But as a child of God, you need to know that the Son of God is praying for you. He's interceding for you. And He's going to turn what Satan does into an opportunity to glorify Christ and grow you in your faith. The last passage is the one that actually teaches us that Jesus is praying for us even now. You don't have to turn there, but in Romans 8, Paul asks the question, Who can bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is He who died, yes, rather, who was raised from the dead, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Jesus died for you. He was raised for you. And now He is seated at the right hand of the Father, interceding for you. That ought to empower you with the greatest of boldness. You ought to be able to tear into any circumstances you find yourself in with absolute comfort and courage, knowing that the Son of God is seated at the right hand of the Father, interceding for you. Now, if He's going to do that for us, here's my last question. Shouldn't we be doing that for one another? We've got to pray. Let's pray.